before we start, I would like to say do not try this at home. Now is the time where I put all my technology in this bag. In my experiment, I was not allowed to have any technologies, uh, for instance, smartwatch, smartphones, even my Google Home. I won't even know what time it is. It's going in. It's 2.30, almost 2.30. About 3 p.m., I'll be starting my solitary confinement. But before that, I need to turn this off too. In your own words, what is solitary confinement? Ooh, this is difficult. Um, solitary confinement is being in a space alone that you have no contact to anybody outside. I think like prison, um, you're separated from everyone else. Um, you kind of think like padded walls. Wow, um, it's when you put someone in a room and say, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> what are some impacts on a person who goes through a solitary confinement or what kind of impact would it have on someone, someone's mental health? Um, well, I know when I'm alone for too long, I start going crazy. So I would assume it's the same for anyone in that situation. My sense would be that it would have significantly negative impacts on their mental health and is probably not an effective way to treat a human being. Recently, there has been many YouTube videos of people going into solitary confinement. Would you ever do it as a social experiment? Absolutely not. <laughs> Depending on how long, like maybe a few hours, but I couldn't do it for a long period of time, no. I would consider it depending on the length of time. Um, I don't know, maybe like for a very short period of time, but I don't, I would not be able to do it for any kind of extended period at all. Solitary confinement is when a person is in a cell, uh, especially in a tight space, uh, alone for uh, about 24 hours um, in a period of time. Hello, hello. Oh. All set up. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'm worried for you. Yeah, I kind of don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Wait, are you, are you just recording yourself being alone? Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Good luck. Good luck. It's 2.40. Officially, my experiment starts. There are many ways long-term solitary confinement can actually affect a person, including hallucination, hypersensitivity to noise and touch, insomnia and paranoia, uncontrollable feelings of rage and fear, distortion of time and perception, risk of suicide, and PTSD. <sighs> I don't know what time it is, but I just kind of slept for a few hours and you know, I think it kind of helped me cope that this actually is happening. But now that I'm awake, I gotta do something. I gotta find something to eat first because I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> first meal, <laughs> just a sandwich. Or two, maybe. I don't know. I uh, can't believe that this has started. So I usually eat food while using my phone or something. Either by like watching YouTube videos or, you know, just going on Facebook or something. So it's kind of weird that I'm just staring at the wall and just eating my peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> you know what's worse? <laughs> when I'm eating and staring at the wall, I actually see pictures of my friends. My first reason why I wanted to start this uh, social experiment on solitary confinement was to kind of give an aware uh, on 
solitary confinement. I wanted people to realize what solitary confinement is and kind of show what that does to a, a typical normal you know, student, especially a normal person. When I interviewed other people, um, it seemed like uh, most people' um, opinion on solitary confinement was just uh, they deserve it, but I think they should be more aware of the whole idea of solitary confinement, especially what happens in the negative side effect. Yeah, so I think there's two social psychological theories that touch on this. One is the belief in a just world. So the belief in a just world says that people get what's coming to them. And so good outcomes happen to good people, bad outcomes happen to bad people. What that means is that when things are going well for people, they hold that belief because that just means, well, they're a good person because good things are happening to me. And they can hold the belief that bad things are happening to other people because they're bad and they deserve them. That becomes problematic when something bad happens to you because none of us like to think that we're bad. Second social psychological theory that bears on this is what's called system justification theory. And people are very quick, often, and certain kinds of people especially, are very quick to justify the system and the status quo. And so they say, well, this is the way we've always done it. I'm sure it'll work. Who am I to question the system? And so if it's always worked, let's just keep on doing it because it must have been put in for a reason. Let's not question that. So I think there's a lot of reasons for uh, for blaming people or promoting the status quo, even though they know that it's probably harmful or not beneficial. <sighs> Current situation, um, I kind of feel very claustrophobic. Uh, it feels like my chest, someone is like squeezing it really hard. I can feel my heart beating. I can feel my, my breathing uh, being faster than normal. I feel like I'm getting, I'm in like a very tight, tight space and it's, the room is getting smaller and smaller. There were two cases where maybe I could consider it as a panic attack. I woke up uh, feeling my heart rate started to rise. My sh uh, breath was very short and my, I could kind of feel my hands shaking a little bit. It wasn't very long, it was very short, like maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds of a, a panic attack, but I could, definitely feel like my chest, there was something pressing on my chest during those two cases of panic attacks. Long-term solitary confinement is a terrible punishment. Uh, short of torture, it is probably the worst punishment. And that's because we human beings are made with a deep need to belong. We are social animals. Uh, our ancestors thrived in groups supporting one another. And we thrive and flourish when we're connected to other people. We're not meant to be alone. And so when people are isolated with just themselves and nobody else. That is a terrible form of human punishment. Solitary confinement cuts across basic human needs. So we have a human need to belong. We are evolutionarily programmed for relationships with other people. Um, you know, being separated from other people for so long, you know, really works against some of the, the ways that we were designed to thrive and flourish. So I woke up maybe an hour or two ago, but I didn't really want to do anything. So I just lied down on my bed, trying to get more sleep because yesterday um, was probably one of the worst nights. I was constantly woken up um, ever so often um, while I was sleeping. Cause I got nothing to do. Um, I just, do some magic.
I'm starting to get really annoyed with the AC sound, the wind that comes out from the AC. Oh, it's just very loud and I can't stop it. So like, it's just, I feel like my head, like inside my head, it's just constantly ringing due to the sound and it's getting annoying and it's making me mad. Uh. <sighs> mm, I haven't eaten yet. Being in here kinda, I lose all motivation to do anything. Even the things that I enjoy like magic. Um, just don't want to do anything My body says I'm hungry, but I Don't really want to eat either Right you just felt bored right? Yeah, I mean like I mentioned people are a, other people are a great source of meaning and when those go away We sometimes wonder well like well, what's the point right? So like what's the point of magic if no one's around right? What's the point of? Uh, of lots of things and so we can kind of feel purposeless or bored or because uh, we don't have that stimulation. We're just staring at a wall. We don't have other people to interact with. And so it seems very possible that you got an overwhelming sense of being bored and, and that sense of disconnection made you lose a little bit of, of a sense of purpose at that time. So two things come to mind. One, as you mentioned, you were in a circumstance of at least mild sensory deprivation. You didn't have the normal sensory stimulation that you have, and that accounted for your heightened sensitivity to what was coming in. Secondly, uh, there's a phenomenon of, that we know as attention. Our conscious attention can be on but one thing at a time. As we're sitting in this room, there is uh, the noise of a fan, of an air yeah. circulation here, but as you and I are talking, we don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But if we stop talking, we can hear it. Uh, when we're engaged in, maybe you're reading, maybe you're talking to somebody, you don't know your attention can be in one place at a time. It can't be in two places. It just can't be. Uh, so if you have no other stimulation, if you're not reading anything, you're not watching TV, uh, you're not talking to anybody, suddenly that near fan noise, you start to notice and it captures your attention. Uh, so that's what you were experiencing because normally you don't attend to such irrelevance. Uh, uh, homogenous stimuli. I don't know how long it's been, but I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't think I can last until Sunday and <sighs> the noise definitely is making me very mad, but I'm very bored and um, I want to talk to people, I want to hang out with people, and it is definitely hard when you have nothing to do and you're just staring at the wall. I feel like I wasted a lot of time doing this experiment, and to the viewers, please do not try this at home, it will drive you crazy. I need to get out, get something to eat as well. Yeah, and also talk to someone. It was very hard to know what time it was, so it was very hard to um, continue the process of being in solitary confinement because, like, I didn't have a way to uh, know what time it is. So I didn't know how long I have uh, in order to continue this um, experiment. Uh, I mean, in general, if we reward people for doing what we want them to do, that's more effective than punishing them for what we don't want them to do. And so I would try to construct an environment that incentivizes people for desirable behavior. I'm not saying the punishment has no effectiveness, uh, but generally 
what you want to do is not just stop people from doing something bad, but encourage them and nudge them towards doing what's going to help them flourish and what's going to be positive. And the way to do that, if you're a child or an employee or a prisoner, is to catch them doing something good, something positive, and reward that, re positively reinforce that, because re behavior that's followed by a reward or a positive reinforcer tends to grow stronger with time. Yeah, I think I think solitary confinement is more of this retribution punishment for people who are already being punished. I think what we need to do is we need to shift towards restoration. We need to shift towards rehabilitation. We need to shift towards more productive solutions. Um, you know, in in a way, it's trying to say that thing you did was bad, but it never suggests the right thing to do. How do people? How do, how do any of us learn what the right thing to do is if we're only punished? Uh, and, and in such an inhumane way, I think that needs to be looked at. And so I think uh, alternatives, uh, I think there's a number of alternatives that, that correctional facilities are already instituting. I think therapeutic treatment groups need to be looked at, therapeutic communities. Uh, I think there's a host of other ways that people, any of us, any individual can be engaged in more restorative, productive ways rather than threatening, taking away someone's basic need for other people. I was very surprised when I came upon this research where the longest ever recorded of a person being in solitary confinement was 43 years because I didn't think anyone could last that long. Even for me, I couldn't last 30 hours and, um, and it was very hard during those social experiments, which I would probably never do this experiment again. But when I heard that there was a man who was um, in solitary confinement for 43 years. That's something that, I don't know, I can't put it in my mind. There are, I'm sure, people who studied the consequences of that sort of long-term solitary confinement. I have not. I can imagine that a person emerging from 43 years of solitary confinement is gonna be a very different person than the person that went in for two reasons. One is the experience of solitary confinement is gonna make that person a less social person probably than they were when they started. The second is that they're 43 years older. And so if you take a 20 year old, uh, that person without solitary confinement is gonna have a, a more subdued personality. It's gonna be less disruptive, less temperamental at age 63, 43 years later. When I first did a little bit of research about this guy, I thought uh, the 43 years was like many, many years ago, maybe like 100 years or 200 years ago, because it kind of sounds like 40, no one would do 43 years now, but it's very recent. It's actually, he was released in 2016. And uh, knowing that, and knowing that uh, solitary confinement is still going on, I was very surprised that some man out there is probably spending years of years of years of solitary confinement, which is, I think it's very sad. So first of all, I think that's uh, stunning. I mean, absolutely stunning in, in a, in an awful way that, that for whatever reason we decided someone decided that more than four decades someone should be in a room by themselves for most of the hours and most of their life uh, just seems inhumane um, I also would really question the logic if the goal of incarceration is to prepare people for healthy reintegration and contribution to society in productive and flourishing ways how would isolating someone to be by themselves for that long, for more than 43 years, prepare them to become a productive member of society again once they're reintegrated back into society? It's really setting someone up to fail. It's, it's setting someone up to recidivate, to go back to, um, to prison. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a strategy for success. Do you think solitary confinement as a punishment is justifiable? Why or why not? I think I think in the traditional sense of like the traditional definition of it, probably not. I think I think there are ways that it could be done in a safer mannerism, but in the traditional sense of it, no. Part of me wants to say yes, part of me wants to say no. I think it's based on the type of crime they commit and like how like it's affected other people. Like say it's like a mass like murder or whatever. Like he, he did it to himself. Like he's the one who went out and did that. Like yeah, like he should be put into solitary confinement, I think. But also like 
there's a bunch of health risks that go with that. So there needs to be like psychological resources for him to go to afterwards, like after he gets out of that period of time. I feel the same way. I think the only time it potentially could be would be for the safety of other individuals that are incarcerated. I think there are times when it's appropriate, but I would say long term, the effects probably wouldn't be good. I would think that it's a last gap form of punishment, but I've not been a prison superintendent, and so I haven't been out there dealing with the situations that they're having to deal with. And so sitting here in the ivory tower, I want to be cautious about pretending to be expert on something that I'm not an expert on. But if I were to become a prison superintendent, it would be a punishment I would hope to use rarely, if ever. Again, I really have a hard time with something that cuts across one of our fundamental needs. Um, you know, if the, if the goal of incarceration is to remove the person from society because they're a threat and or some type of rehabilitation, I think that you've already removed them. You don't need to remove them again. Uh, and I think that there could be a way for, uh, for the community to engage in a way that focuses more on, on restoration and rehabilitation instead.